you've ever had a time of suffering in your life, whether it was illness or injury or persecution or financial problems or relationship problems, people hurt you and let you down, if there's ever been a time in your life that you've had difficulty, then I hope that today's message will be very encouraging to you. Because here's what I want you to understand. God is our strength. It doesn't matter whether your problem is an unforeseen illness or whether your problem is with your spouse or your children or your job. God is the sustaining force in the life of believers. And whenever we turn to Him, we find the strength to get through life's problems. James is where we've been at, and today we're finishing up the book of James. And in the last few verses here in the book of James, he was writing to a church that was suffering persecution. Now, you and I today are probably not experiencing any persecution. Perhaps you might be uh, experiencing a little ridicule from your family or or a little uh, being overlooked at work. But, but that's about the extent of persecution that we would have to deal with in America today. But these principles apply not just to persecution, but to any difficulty that we might face in life. It's that when we begin to understand that God has given us a reason to look into the future with hope and expectation. And he's taught us how to call upon him and how to access his power in our lives. When we understand this, it changes how we face life's difficulties. So James chapter 5 is where we're going to be at today. James chapter 5, beginning in verse 7, and we'll be reading to the end of the book in verse 20. So I want to ask you, would you stand with me out of honor and reverence for God's word as we read James chapter 5, beginning in verse 7. This is what it says. Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and the late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remained steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. Above all, my brothers, do not swear, either by heaven or by earth, or by any other oath. But let your yes be yes, and your no be no, so that you may not fall under condemnation. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church, and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Let's pray together. Father, we come before you today with a prayer of faith, believing that you are with us and in us. And Father, I pray today for any listener that's discouraged, hurting, confused, or frustrated. God, may they turn to you today to find strength in you. For it's in your Son's name that we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Well, I want you to notice that James calls our attention to the return of Christ. And you see, the imminent return of Christ 
gives us the strength to be patient in suffering. The Bible tells us here that we can learn from the example of farmers who wait for the rain. Notice what it says in verses 7 through 8 that we just read. It says, be patient. Be patient. Now, in the Bible, in the New Testament, the word patient doesn't mean exactly the same thing that, that we use it to mean today. Often today, when we say patient, all, all we simply mean is don't, don't be antsy about something, but, but just wait. But in the Bible, the word patience has a connotation that includes more than just not being antsy about something, but it includes continuing on and persevering. That's why some translations use the word steadfast. And so in this passage, the Bible talks about the steadfastness of the prophets. So, so God is not calling us just to simply sit here and wait without complaining, but God is calling us to continue on patiently and persistently being steadfast in our faith. And it's easy to have faith in the Lord when everything is going well, isn't it? When you're healthy, job's going well, everything's good at home, it's easy to have faith in the Lord. But if we're going to have faith when things are difficult, we need something more than a shallow, superficial faith. We need to come to the point in our life that we realize that God is reliable and trustworthy, and regardless of what our circumstances are around us, we can depend upon Him. And when we get to that point in our life that we understand that we can trust God, then it gives us the ability to persist and be patient and steadfast in our faith regardless of whether we're up or whether we're down. Because if you live for very long, you're going to be up and you're going to be down. And so God gives us the strength. And one of the things that gives us the strength is the knowledge that Jesus at any moment could return for us. And so he says, take an example from the farmer. This is what he says. Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and the late rains. You also be patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Well, I, I think we all know, even if you didn't grow up on a farm, that you can't sow corn in the morning and harvest it in the afternoon. It's a long process. And not only is it a long process, but there are so many factors that are simply outside of the control of the farmer. And in this passage, he explicitly references rain, rain. When I grew up in East Tennessee, it's very uh, hilly, mountainous. Uh, there's a lot of limestone rock protruding from fields and stuff. It's just not conducive to row crops. We just don't have hardly any row crops there. And so you, the land just doesn't, just doesn't work. And so I grew up, we had uh, cattle that we farmed, and we also raised tobacco. And when I pastored in North Carolina, and that was my first exposure to really, I guess what I would call industrial size farming. You know, we had three acres of tobacco when I was growing up. And when I went to North Carolina, you know, one of my guys had a thousand acres of corn and soybeans that he dealt with. And so it was just kind of a, it was, it was a new thing for me. And so as I would listen to those guys talk, uh, the greatest subject of their conversations was always, you guessed it, the rain, the rain. Everything was dependent upon the rain. And I didn't really understand all the science. I mean, I had some really educated guys. Some of my farmers had uh, master's degrees in agriculture and, and different things. And I mean, they really had it down to a science. And, and I would try to engage in the conversation have you ever tried to fit in, but you didn't know what anybody was talking about? Yeah. Kind of like when you guys are talking about U.K. basketball. I really don't know what's going on. I, the only thing I know is there's some kind of playoff or tournament or something going on. I'm not really sure if it's a SEC. I don't even know what's happening. I do know that we're playing y'all today, and we've already beat you twice this year, so good luck with that. But, but I don't really know how it all works. I'm just not a basketball person, you know. Y'all may convert me into one because that's all you think about sometimes, but uh, I'm just not a basketball person. Well, I was over there, and I did not understand farming on their level. And so uh, it, it would rain, and I would try to act like I was, you know, in with them, and I would say, I said, man, guys, I said, did you see all that rain we got yesterday? I said, wasn't that great? 
And they would look at me like I had a third eye and, and said, no, it's not great. Don't you understand that if we get that much rain at this point in the season, it, it, could, it could wash? And they would start explaining all these things that could go wrong. And said, so we can't handle any more rain. And so we'd go about five days without rain. And, I, and you know, I try to intercede in the, in the conversation. I'd say, guys, we've been five days now with no rain. And I'd say, it's looking good for the corn crop this year, isn't it? And they'd say, are you crazy? If we don't get some more rain the next couple of days, I mean, they... They just, they knew. And I mean, they weren't guessing. They really did understand the science. And they knew that they needed the right amount of rain at the right time, not too much, not too little, not too early, not too late, in order to have a bumper crop. But they weren't in control of the rain. They were patiently waiting and hoping that it would come. You see, the reason that they went through all of that is because they knew at the end of the season, months after they'd begin the season, there would be a crop and it would be harvested. And if everything went well, it would be sold and they would receive a check. You see, James says that we need to learn from that. We need to learn from how the farmer initiates something and plans and prepares and waits on the rain and anticipates what is to come. And you see, when we live our life in anticipation of the return of the Lord, like the farmer who can't control the rain, we're not in control of when the Lord's going to return. But we do know with certainty that He is going to return. And so when we understand that the Lord may return at any moment, it should cause us to live with a new hope and a new expectation of what is to come. And so whenever we understand that this world really is not our home, it gives us a different perspective about life. You know, I don't really like sitting in airport terminals, but I don't get too upset about it because I know I'm just there for a moment to wait for my ride out of there. And so it is with life. One day, unexpectedly, the Lord is going to return. And so whatever problem that you have at the moment, I can promise you that it is only temporary. Matthew 24, 36 through 42 this is what it says about the return of the Lord. It says, but concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. For as were the days of Noah, so will be com the coming of the Son of Man. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day when Noah entered the ark. And they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two men will be in the field, and one will be taken, and one will be left. Two women will be grinding at the meal. One will be taken, and one will be left. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. Well, the Bible says that Jesus is going to come again, and it gives us examples of people that are working. And as he talks about Noah, what he's talking about is that everybody was just going through life as normal. People were getting married. People were getting jobs. People were planning their future. And then all of a sudden, the flood came. And the Bible says that the return of Christ is going to be in the same way. People are going to be going through med school and preparing for a life of medicine. And, and all of a sudden, the Lord's going to come. People are going to be getting married and thinking about how they're going to spend their life with the love of their life and how they're going to grow old in retirement together. But all of a sudden, things are going to end when the Lord returns suddenly. The Bible teaches us that at any moment, the Lord could return, and nobody is going to predict it or foresee it when it's going to happen. And so therefore, because we know with certainty that it's going to happen, we need to always be prepared and always be ready. You see, our expectation of the return of Christ should change how we live. That's why it says in verse 9, Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. Well, that's an admonition against not getting along with other people in church and grumbling all the time and complaining about everything. And what James is saying is basically, don't do anything that you don't want to be caught doing when the Lord returns because you never know when He is going to return. Have you ever thought about this? Would you really want to be in the middle of, of gossiping about somebody when the Lord returns? 
James says, don't grumble against one another, brothers, because the judge is at the door. You see, when we begin to understand that Jesus Christ is going to return one day, he's going to return suddenly, and he could return at any moment, then it gives us different hope, and it gives us the strength to persevere, knowing that whatever we're dealing with is only a temporary problem. Verses 10 through 12. James teaches that God's compassion and mercy, they give us strength to be patient in suffering. He gives the example of the prophets. Look in verse 10. He says, as, a, as an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Well, what James is talking about is all the Old Testament prophets who were faithful to God, and because they were faithful, they suffered because of it. We think about John the Baptist. John the Baptist, who was, who was the Billy Graham of his day. John the Baptist didn't go places to preach. The people came to him. He went out in the wilderness, and thousands of people went out to hear him preach. And he was so faithful in his preaching that Herod beheaded him for it. And James is saying, take the example of these prophets. They were faithful, and yet they suffered, but they experienced the mercy of and the compassion of God. Hebrews eleven thirty two gives a list of some of the prophets of the Old Testament. And he says, And what more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel, and the prophets who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received back their dead by resurrection. Some were tortured, refusing to accept release so that they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were killed with a sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering about in deserts and mountains and in dens and in caves of the earth. You say, well, what's encouraging about that? What's encouraging is that James is saying is that even though the prophets suffered during this life, they went on to a great honor in the life to come. And God was faithful to them. And he gives us the example of Job. Listen to what he says in verses 11 through 12 about Job. And Job, Job is a great example of us, of how to endure suffering. Listen to what he says. Behold, we consider those blessed who remained steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you've seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. But above all, my brothers, do not swear, either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you may not fall under condemnation. Well, what's he talking about? You see, Job suffered greatly in this life. Job lost all of his wealth in a day. He lost his family. He lost his friends. Everyone around him thought that Job was being disciplined for his sin. And then after Job patiently endures all of this, he asked God for an explanation. And this is the explanation that God gives to Job. He says, Job, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? And he goes on to set Job in his place as God is the creator and Job as the creation. And as Job hears from God Almighty, he comes back and he realizes that surely these things were too wonderful for me to know. And so God never answers Job's questions. But I want you to understand this. God has used Job and his life to inspire and encourage and instruct millions of people throughout history. You'd be hard-pressed to find a person in America today that hasn't heard of Job. 
Do we not say today the patience of Job? You see, Job was not suffering without any reason. Satan had come to God and he had challenged God and he said, said, consider Job your servant. He said, he's only good because you bless him with everything. He said, you've given him money, you've given him family. He said, he's got everything anybody could want. Of course he loves you. Take it all away and he'll curse you to your face. And God allowed Job to demonstrate that there are people that are true to their faith in God and believe in him and are faithful not only when things are good but when things are bad. And Job is an example for us how to be persistent and how to continue in your faith regardless of whether everything in your life is going smooth or not. Job is a great example for us. And so that was, that's what James is saying. He said, look at all the people that gave an example for us that they were faithful to God even when things in their life were difficult. The last few verses here begins to talk about prayer. But you see, prayer and faith is how we access the power of God. Notice what he says in verse 13. Is any among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with the oil in the name of the Lord. Well, James is teaching us here that for every physical problem, there's a spiritual solution. And James is teaching us that when we're suffering, whatever that suffering might be, we need to seek the Lord in prayer. And in this passage, he gives them this instruction. He says, if anybody's sick, call for the elders of the church and, and let them anoint with oil in the name of the Lord. Well, most Baptists, if we say anything about anointing with oil, people just get really nervous. And, and uh, uh, one time we were at a church and... And some people requested to be anointed with oil and prayed over, and that's exactly what we did. And we did it because you know, that's what the Scripture says. And somebody said, Pastor, if you're not careful, somebody's going to think that we're a bunch of holy rollers. And I don't know if you've ever been in a holy roller service or not before, but I can assure you there's zero chance that anybody's going to think that we're a bunch of holy rollers. This is not going not to happen. You see, oil in the Bible, is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. And what you do when you anoint somebody with oil is an outward symbol to express your faith in the power of God and the working of the Holy Spirit. And so there's nothing special about the oil. It's just an outward way to symbolize something that you believe and that you're expressing your faith in. So, so it, shouldn't, it shouldn't freak you out or, or, or think that it's something weird about anointing somebody with oil. With oil, that's all that it is. It's an outward way to symbolize what we believe. When you anoint with somebody with oil and pray over them, what you're saying is that, that you believe that the Holy Spirit is alive and well and that God hears prayers and answers prayers, and you're calling on Him in faith to answer that prayer. You see, this is the key to prayers being answered. It's our faith. James talked about in the first part of this book that if you go to God, but you're not believing and you don't have faith, then you shouldn't think that God is going to answer that prayer. The way that prayers are answered is that when we pray to God, we pray in faith. Now, some people get off track here and think that God is kind of like a genie. We just ask him for things and whatever we ask for, he's going to give it. And if he doesn't give it, it's because we didn't believe in it. And this is not the case. Jesus taught us to pray like this. He taught us to pray according to our Father's will. And so I recognize that sometimes I may ask for things and God doesn't give me what I ask for. Because it's not consistent with his will for that person or that place or that moment in my life. But when I pray, I pray in faith knowing that God is able. He's able to do anything. And if I pray according to his will, then I can expect him to answer in great power. And so James gives us this example of another Old Testament prophet. He gives us the example of Elijah. And listen to what he says in verse 16. The prayer of a righteous person has great power power as it is working. I want you to notice the second quality there. The prayer must not only be offered in faith, 
But our condition before God has something to do with whether the prayers are answered. It doesn't say the prayer of any person. It's just the prayer of a righteous person. If you want your prayers to be answered, then confess your sin before God and ask for forgiveness. And when you come into a right relationship with God, then call out in faith, knowing He's able to answer and provide anything that you need. And when you come to Him with a right attitude and a right spiritual condition, then you can expect prayer to be answered. Verse 17, it says, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. That's so important for us to understand that Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. Here's what he's saying. Elijah was just a man. He was no different from us. He was just a man. And so if Elijah was just a man, and, and you and I, we're, we're just human beings, men and women, then we ought to be able to do what Elijah did. That's what James is saying. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Well, Elijah lived during the time of Ahab and Jezebel. And Ahab, King Ahab, was the king of Israel. He had married Jezebel, and Jezebel uh, was a Baal worshiper. And Baal was a Canaanite god that the people believed was the, the god of fertility. They believed that Baal was the god of fertility, and so therefore he was in control of the rain. And so if you wanted your crops to be fertile, then you pray to Baal, and Baal would send the rain, and the crops would grow, and everything would be plentiful. It's really a, a gospel of prosperity, no different from what people are preaching today. And so Jezebel had brought in Baal worship into the nation of Israel, and she had brought in all these prophets. There was hundreds of prophets of Baal that are teaching this, and bringing people into idolatry and worshiping Baal instead of worshiping the one true God. And so that's why Elijah prayed that it would not rain. When Elijah prayed that it would not rain, he was not acting like God was a genie in the bottle and telling God what to do. He was not praying that it wouldn't rain so that it would help him personally and financially. Elijah prayed in the will of God because God's will was for Elijah to confront the prophets of Baal, and to show Israel that he was the one true God and not Baal. And so Elijah went before God and he prayed that it would not rain. And so for three years and six months, not a drop of rain fell. There was an absolute drought. And the prophets of Baal cried out to Baal and prayed, and nothing happened. And the people of Israel saw through the faith and the prayer of Elijah that he was the true prophet of God. And what James is teaching us is that when God's man prays in accordance with God's will, great things happen. This is the secret to accessing the power of God, that we come to him in prayer, and we come to him in prayer believing that he is able to, to answer. And so whatever you're dealing with today, God is the solution to your problem. He is our strength in sickness. He is our strength in discouragement, disappointment. He is our strength when the economy is down. He is our strength when people have abandoned us. And we can live with hope and expectation because we know that great things are coming for those of us that love Him. As bad as things may seem sometime, one day, one day, unexpectedly, Jesus Christ is going to return. And for everybody that loves Him, He's going to take us with Him. And when we look forward with that expectation, it gives us hope and strength to live and to press on in this life. And if you get discouraged, look at the people at the Old Testament. The people like Elijah, the people like John the Baptist, the people like David, the people that believed in God and were faithful to Him. And when you look around and you, you wonder, why is God doing this in my life? It doesn't make any sense. Think of Job, who though he didn't understand what God was doing, God was working greatly in his life. 
And then we come to God in prayer. We come to God in prayer believing that He is able to answer. And when we come as a righteous person, not a perfect person, but a person who has confessed their sin and been forgiven and is in a right relationship with God, when we come before God as a righteous person praying in faith, we should expect something to happen because God is our strength.